All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our August edition of First Fridays at B. Super excited to have you all here today. Um, as a few people have already commented on in the um, chat function, it is a beautiful morning to talk about wine. And so we're so excited to have you here this morning uh, for a great conversation with some wonderful presenters. Um, I'm Megan, part of the team from Food of the North, and along with Annie and Gia, we organize this monthly event. Um, if you haven't had a chance, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box. It's always nice to see who's here and um, generate some conversation on there. Um, and for those who are new to First Fridays, welcome. Very excited to have you here for the monthly event that we host um, as part of Food of the North. So First Fridays is really um, a place where we try to begin a conversation around a food or agriculture topic in our community. And so every month we decide on a different theme and then we ask awesome local people from our community to speak to that. And typically during non-COVID times, we're over at Theater B in Moorhead, um, but we've been doing this event via Zoom for a few months now and um, it seems to be okay, although we do miss um, seeing all you wonderful folks that usually join us um, in person. Um, but what's going to happen today is each of our presenters is going to give a really short presentation, just five minutes about um, an area of wine or grape production that is particularly um, passion is a particular passion of theirs. And then the bulk of our presentation is for Q and A. So you will see on the bottom of your screen on the um, right side, there is a Q&A box. And throughout today's program, please feel free to um, chat your questions in there um, so that we can um, answer those at the end of our presentation. And for those who are new to Zoom, there's a great function on there where you can also upvote questions. Um, so if there is an awesome question that you wanna make sure gets asked today, um, please give that an upvote so that we can get to all the wonderful um, questions that you have and that you wanna have answered by our presenters. So um, before we jump into our present today, presentations today, I have just a few quick announcements from Food of the North. Annie, next slide. So one of the things that we have been busy with this summer on a Food of the North end is redesigning our website. And um, if you head over to foodofthenorth.com, you'll see that it has a new feel, but it also has um, some really awesome new content on there. And the three big pieces in the middle, grow, buy, and get involved, we have been spending a lot of time trying to consolidate resources in the community for where people can grow local food in terms of um, the uh, community gardens in our community where you can support local plant nurseries. Um, on the buy side, all the farmers markets, all the um, CSAs, um, grocery stores that are um, sourcing local food, and then get involved or places to volunteer that are um, wonderful um, nonprofits and organizations in our community that are doing really wonderful things. So um, you'll see at the bottom, it says wanted your feedback. So we are very much in the infancy of this. Um, we just launched it, um, but we know our First Fridays community is so engaged in the local food world. So we would love for you to take a look, let us know what you think, what we're missing. Um, we really want this to be something that is um, curating from our community in terms of what you want and what you would like to see on there. So um, take a look and um, let us know your feedback. You can shoot any of us a message or um, send us an email to info at foodofthenorth.com. Next slide. So in addition to working on that this summer, we also hosted an event um, a couple weeks ago um, called Food Justice in the North. And um, in light of some of the events that happened um, earlier this summer and um, some of the conversation that sparked from that, we really wanted to begin a conversation in our community about food justice. And so um, we had three wonderful presenters from the University of Minnesota Extension who shared a lot of great feedback and perspectives on the way um, they implement food justice work in the communities that they live in, um, as well as ideas for what we can do to um, further advance that in the Fargo-Moorhead area. Um, and the conversation was moderated by Representative Ruth Buffalo. Um, so if you look in the chat, I'm just dropping the link in there right now. Um, so it's an online video. We'd love for you to check it out. Um, 
And please know that, that this is just a first starting place. We, um, we also welcome feedback on terms of um, what next steps we need to take in the community to continue to advance this work. So um, again, shoot us a message. This was done in combination with NDSU Extension and the Cast Clay Food Partners. So um, a lot of great groups working together um, and would love to um, continue that conversation and involve you if you're interested in. So thank you for that. Um, next slide. And with that, I'm going to um, pass it over to Noelle Hardin from the Cast Clay Food Partners. She's going to give a little update on some of the things that they've been working on this summer, as well as some of the things that they have coming up. And just uh, um, for those who are new to First Fridays, this is an event we do in combination with the Cast Clay Food Partners. They really focus on that food policy lens of things that they would like to see change in the community. We do more um, engaging people in conversations um, in, in different ways, but we really work in partnership with them. So it's always great to know um, what's happening on their end. Um, so Noelle, go ahead. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Megan, Annie, and Gia for the invite and putting together what I'm sure will be another awesome event this morning. Um, yes, so as uh, Megan shared, um, the Cass Clay Food Partners, um, we work on a lot of different things related to food in the community. Um, but one of our main areas is um, policy work. Um, during COVID, we also have done a lot of information sharing. Um, so we usually do that through our Facebook page. Again, you can find us by searching for Cast Clay Food Partners. Um, we've been providing regular updates on Facebook Live. Um, this week, we shared um, some of the rules and regulations around selling or purchasing local food um, across the state border. So that's a very relevant topic here in the Cass Clay area. And you can um, check out that information by looking on our Facebook page. Um, we also have been shifting to do more guest updates. Um, our network tends to work kind of more behind the scenes and we like to get in the weeds of things like city codes and ordinances. Um, so we, we would love to use our platform um, to spread the word about work that you may be doing. Um, if you have things that you would like to share, um, we're happy to do that. And Megan was on a couple weeks ago with some information from Food of the North, um, and that was really wonderful to be able to kind of make that connection stronger. Um, so we've been continuing to look at um, city codes, policies, Right now, we're digging into the issue of um, selling local food and what residents are allowed to do um, from their own property in terms of selling produce, honey, um, processing small livestock, game, things like that. Um, and then lastly, we have um, gotten a couple policy changes through in Fargo this summer that are temporary. Um, so if you are involved in any way with the new Boulevard Garden policy um, or the change with Backyard Chickens in Fargo, um, we would love to hear from you on that. So I'll share um, my contact information through the chat in just a moment. Um, again, you can also get a hold of us through Facebook. And then lastly, we'll be having our next Cast Clay Food Commission meeting um, which includes elected officials from our seven jurisdictions. Um, that will be happening September 9th, and we'll have more information on that in the next couple weeks. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to hearing about wine. Awesome, thank you so much, Noelle. So much good stuff happening with the food partners and that policy lens is so important. All right, so now I'm excited to introduce today's program, Drink Local on Wine from Vine to Glass with our three wonderful speakers. So the evolution of wine is a long and fascinating history. The early evidence of grape wine dates back to around 6,000 BCE in Western Iran. And for centuries, well, millennia, humans have enjoyed countless variations of wine by fermenting local fruits and our place in the world is no exception. The joy of winemaking has been enjoyed by hobbyists in our region for decades, but the venture of making and selling local wines as a business is a somewhat new endeavor. As interest in local products has surged, so has the number of vineyards and wineries in our region. And with increased local production, the research has followed across the state to grow hardy grapes and other fermentable fruits that can withstand our somewhat harsh growing conditions. Today, we're excited to welcome three passionate experts on grape and wine production. 
Greg Cook, along with his wife, Lisa, are the owners of 4E Winery, which is just south of Castleton. 4E grew out of a passion to craft quality wines from pure Northern Prairie ingredients. They purchased their Farmstead Winery in 2012 and been, have been working on their dream ever since. In addition to making wine, Greg also has a PhD in organic, in organic chemistry and is a professor of chemistry at North Dakota State University. Harleen Hatterman Valenti is a professor and assistant chair for the plant sciences department at North Dakota State University. Her research focuses on high value crop production, including developing hardy grape varieties adapted to the North Dakota climate. And last but not least, Mark Vining is the owner and winemaker for Rookery Rock Winery, located at Agassiz Shores Orchard and Vineyard, which is west of Fargo. They feature a wide variety of wines produced from fruits, berries, and cold hardy grapes grown on a 12 acre orchard. And with that, I'd like to um, say how excited I am for today's presentation and to learn a lot about one of my absolute favorite beverages. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Greg Cook. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you all this morning about what is obviously one of my passions because I spend every waking moment outside of work uh, working on this. Um, and I thought I'd just take a few minutes and, and talk about my journey to this place. And it really starts way back when I was a young kid. <clears throat> and it starts with local foods, I think, because I remember growing a tiny little vegetable garden in my backyard and, and harvesting my beans and my carrots. And, and I would go out into the woods in, where I grew up in Michigan and forage for wild berries and fruits. And I was just very interested in how to get food from the land around us. Um, and I think that grew even when I was a kid into learning about how to preserve them. And that led to learning about fermentation. And I remember as a kid going to the library checking out all these books on home winemaking and, and, and writing down all the recipes and learning about how you could take different fruits and ferment them and make something that would last. I really wasn't interested in the alcohol back then. It was really about the fermentation. Um, and I think from there, I uh, uh, really started um, learning about wine. I spent a little bit of time out in California. And so there, my love for tasting wine really grew. And when I moved to Fargo in 1996, that's when I really began as a home winemaker in earnest. And I think um, that really uh, was eye opening because I got to actually put my hands on fruits to make wine. Um, and back then there were no grapes to be had. So it became a passion of making wine from local fruits that grew on the prairie. And so that would be rhubarb and choke cherry and plums and all of the wild fruits that are around us. Um, and I, I think even today in our winery, we do some of that um, uh, fruit wine, non-grape wines as well. Um, and I, I started uh, as a home winemaker over 25 years ago, and um, I used to host parties to taste wines from other local home winemakers, and so we'd get to share and experience what people were making around here. Um, and then, yeah, so in 2012, um, Lisa and I, looked around for some property to build a winery because we wanted to share uh, the passion of local foods and fruits with um, the rest of you. And we were fortunate to find this beautiful historic farmstead just west of Fargo and, and build our winery. We opened in 2015 um, and we do have some vineyards and finally there are some grapes that can be had in this climate uh, to uh, make great wine with. Uh, and we started building uh, property and preserving the land and building prairies to walk on. And, and with the idea that wine is not just the beverage, wine encompasses culture and history, and it is really the essential idea of local foods. If you think about the many thousands and thousands of years history of wine, it was always local. As a matter of fact, most of the laws that in Europe about uh, wine grew up because they wanted to say that these types of grapes came from this region and these types of grapes came from this region. So they actually enacted laws to say what, what grapes could go into what wines from what regions, because that is what about local is. Today it's about agritourism, it's about sharing uh, the local flavors, and, and I am uh, always uh, 
focused on making sure that we're expressing the flavors of the fruits from the lands here. So that's, that's really how we got passionate about wine. Um, I enjoy sharing the property and the wines and the stories and the histories of the grapes with people when they come out to visit. And, and that's what Elisa and I just live for now. Um, of course, none of this could be possible these days. The growth of wineries in North Dakota is made possible because we finally have grapes which can grow and, and survive in our cold climates. And they're bred to have good wine qualities that you wouldn't really expect from a, a cold, uh, frozen north. Um, and provide good wines from dry table wines all the way to sweet, delicious dessert wines. And I think without the research that's continuing to go on today, um, the future wouldn't be as bright as what we see it now. And, and one of the people responsible for that success is Dr. Harleen Hadaman Valenti, who's gonna be speaking next about some of the uh, great breeding programs that she has going on at NDSU. So thank you so much. I look forward to talking with you more and answering questions. I'm gonna turn this over to Harleen. Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Megan, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to actually talk about a little bit about the North Dakota grape and winemaking history. So if I could have that slide, or maybe I don't see it, but maybe it's coming, <laughs> to, to um, give you some bullet points. There we go. Um, of course, the first licensed bondry, bonded winery was in um, 2002. That was even before the North Dakota Farm Winery Act actually um, became a law in 2003. Um, the first bonded winery was uh, the Point of View Winery in Burlington, North Dakota. I started in 2000 as an assistant professor working on high value crops. So. Um, I wasn't even really thinking of grapes when I got started. I was looking at June berries and onions and really my position was to work on potatoes. But when I was working on my master's um, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, I got involved with grapes and I was just like amazed at how, you know, you can go from this, uh, you know, just hardly anything and, and then by the end of the year, have all these clusters and, and just this massive vine. And it was just one of the most amazing plants I've ever worked with. And, and so when this um, law passed for, you know, the Farm Winery um, Act, I went and I said, well, gee whiz, uh, I don't even know if there's a lot of grapes out here, but we need to go and, and try to help the growers who are going to be growing these grapes for for the for the wine, and and so in 2004 you can see that we we started our first research at the North Dakota Horticulture Research Farm, which is near Absaraka, North Dakota, and we had 12 cultivars, and these were cultivars primarily from the University of Minnesota and Elmer Swenson, who was a private breeder uh, in Wisconsin. And, and so we set up that variety trial and we start looking at those in 2004. In 2006, the North Dakota Grape Growers Association formed, and now it is, the name has changed to the North Dakota Grape and Wine Association to be more encompassing. Um, in 2009, so from 2004 until 2009, well, probably in 2006, we started to go in and started to get our fruit. And we were kind of surprised that, you know, these cold hardy grapes, um, especially from the University of Minnesota, which make excellent wines, that um, they just weren't performing as well in our variety trial and, and also in some other locations as we expected. And, and so in 2009, um, there was money allocated from the Department of Agriculture for research. And it, it, I think everyone realized that we needed 
hardier grapes, especially in more of the northern part of North Dakota, maybe not so much in the southern part of, of North Dakota, but you know, the the University of Minnesota grapes, they're they're hardy, but they're hard they were bred for an area around the um Minneapolis area. So if you were in South Dakota or southern part of Minnesota, um, they were working wonderful. Um, in in North Dakota, in a number of locations, they weren't. So we started the North Dakota Grape and Germplasm Enhancement Project, trying to go and breed hardier grapes. We've seen from um, Valiant, which is a cultivar uh, that was released from South Dakota State University, where Dr. Peterson had gone actually to part many parts of uh, northwestern North Dakota as well as eastern um, northeastern Montana to go and collect the Vitus riparia, which is the um, native grape for this area, and he he used those. Um, native grapes in his breeding program and, and introduce Valiant, which I think still is one of the most cold hardy grapes that we have. Um, so we knew it could be possible and perhaps um, from my German background is, you know, when someone says you, ca you can't do that, I'm going to go and, and try to show them that yes, you, we can do that. And so wanted to get to, we put in a lot of work from that time in 2009, 2011, we had our first plants in the ground to start to evaluate. And just this last March, we got the approval for uh, the pre-release of two accessions um, from this grape germplasm enhancement project. There are two whites um, that, um, have shown to be extremely cold hardy. I think you remember two winters ago, uh, we had minus 38 degrees for a couple days, minus 30 for almost a week, and, and so for lows, and they survived. We had some a little bit of injury, but in comparison to even the coldest, or the, the most cold hardy, in that trial, they flourished. And so we're, we're really optimistic that um, these are gonna be cold hardy cultivars that are gonna help our, our growers and the wineries because that's the need is to have that consistency year after year, no matter what mother nature throws us to go and have um, consistent fruit because the fruit comes from the wood from the previous year. And if that dies, then you have no fruit for one year. You'll have probably some flourishing grapes, vines, but without the fruit, really, um, it's not that great of an ornamental. So um, our, our future, I think, is, is great. We're, we're still working hard. We, we're not going to stop just at two whites. We're continuing to look for um, cold hardy red uh, cultivars or accessions right now. Um, and we've been out take, testing and doing crosses and we'll continue to do that to go and help uh, North Dakota growers and, and the wineries uh, come up with local grapes for their wines. And with that, I will now pass this on to Mark, who's gonna talk about his winery. Thank you, Harleen. Um, so you've got to uh, hear from Dr. Cook and you got to hear from Dr. Arlene. Uh, so now you're gonna get dumbed down here because I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm a winemaker. Uh, so uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, so my dad was a winemaker. Uh, he made wine at home from uh, locally sourced fruits and grapes. 
one of the grapes that uh, he used was, uh, it was a Vitis riparia, a wild grape. Um, and it is, uh, it was grown at North Dakota Air National Guard. Uh, and uh, so my dad actually made his first uh, grape wine out of wine from the Air National Guard along with a couple of his friends. Um, and uh, so I now have actually been propagating some of those uh, grape vines that came originally from uh, the first wine that my dad made. And uh, we're gonna put those in our vineyard and we're actually gonna make wild grape wine from cuttings from, from the original vines that my dad's first wine came from. Um, so we've already decided on a name. We probably won't have wine for three years, but his name was Bill. Uh, his nickname at the Air Guard, where he was for 30 years, was Wild Bill. And uh, the North Dakota Air National Guard, his nickname is the Hooligan. So we're going to call it Wild Bill's Hooligan Wine. Um, so we've got some things to look forward to. Uh, personally, I started making wine probably 30 plus years ago. Uh, Greg and I actually made wine together um, and did some uh, uh, seminars together many years ago. Um, most of my wine was made from pears, apples, cherries that I grew in my backyard. Um, then I started experimenting with grapes that were supposed to be cold hardy and uh, quite frankly none of those grape vines or those varieties are planted in my orchard because none of them turned out to be cold hardy. Um, I started looking for a place to turn my hobby out of control into a business. Uh, took several years to find this location. Uh, Agassiz Shores is the name of our location. We are on uh, the exit 322 of I-94, just the abstract exit. So actually fairly close to where Harleen does her uh, uh, experimental uh, work. Um, the location is absolutely ideal. It's um, the Campbell Beach of Lake Agassiz. And as a result of being on the Campbell Beach, we have probably the ideal situation for uh, grapevines. We've got about a foot of sandy loam. And then below that, it is uh, sand and gravel from the beach. So. Um, it is probably the best location I could have found after spending years looking for it. Uh, it worked out really well. Um, so we started in 2009. Uh, we fenced 12 acres with an eight foot high woven wire fence to keep the deer out. Uh, every year since 2009, we have continued to plant. Uh, we now have over 2,000 fruit trees, berry bushes, nut trees, and we have room for 1,800 grapevines. We have about 1,300 in the ground, and we're saving some room for those new grapevines from NDSU. So uh, we're hoping Harleen gets us some real soon. Um, so what should we talk about today? Um, you know, part of the reason that I wanted to be here was uh, to help dispel what is probably a pretty prevalent uh, perception in that North Dakota cannot uh, grow quality fruit and quality grapes quality wine um, and that there's very few varieties that of any of those that will actually grow here. Um, so a couple of takeaways uh, from today. Uh, first of all, there's a large variety of fruits that can be grown in North Dakota uh, and some are actually uh, native to this area. Um, so sea berries, um, you can get June berries, um, aronia berries, the, uh, the high antioxidant berries. Um, and to a lesser degree, we can grow grapes. Um, this was taken out of the vineyard yesterday. This happens to be Marquette. It's just turning color. Um, so to some degree, we can grow grapes. It's uh, a little hit and miss right now. Um, but um, there have been other success stories. Um, Cottonwood Cider House has an organic orchard, apple orchard just uh, up by air. Air Creek Winery in South Fargo has a uh, large and growing orchard and, uh, and vineyard. Uh, Nelson and Roneyberry Farm uh, up by Air, North Dakota are just a couple of examples of, of what can be done in North Dakota, uh, even with the climate that we have and the short growing season. Um, can you make quality wine out of what you can grow? The answer is absolutely we can. Uh, 
you know, there's, we embrace the unique flavors and Greg does that very well also. Um, that's part of his mantra, that's part of my mantra is we embrace the flavors here. We can't grow and we quite frankly don't really want to grow Mark, uh, Cabernet or Chardonnay. Uh, we have unique flavors and we embrace those. Uh, because it's a cold climate, we tend to have more acidic wine, uh, which takes a little while for people's palates to get accustomed to, but uh, we have uh, wines that are crisp and uh, very flavorful. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, we embrace that. Uh, some California wines actually become a little flabby. Uh, they have so much heat that the acidity is completely gone and you get actually a flabby wine. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can make sweet wine. We can also make very dry wine that is, uh, that is very approachable. Uh, we happen to have released recently a, a dry hopped frostbite apple uh, wine. It's, uh, frostbite is University of Minnesota apple, tastes like tangerine. And we dry hopped it with cascade hops, which is a flavoring hop, all of which we grow here. Um, so, you know, we also do some sweet wine, Cascap, Japanese honeyberry wine, um, the uh, black currant wine. Um, so, um, they, we can do all kinds of types of wines and they are high quality. Uh, several wineries across North Dakota and the northern area are winning awards for their wine. And we hear consistently uh, in our tasting room how people are amazed at the quality of the wine that we can make and it's not just all syrupy sweet. And I know other wineries uh, that I've talked to have the same comments from their customers that they're actually surprised at the quality of the wine that can be made. Uh, now, having said that, um, do we want opportunities to find better grapes, grapes that ripen faster, grapes that have better flavor profiles? Absolutely. And so we rely on grape breeding programs uh, such as NDSU to provide that for us. There's also some private breeders that are uh, releasing grape uh, varieties that are helpful to us. So um, the future is looking good. I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities. Um, the wine and agritourism industry in North Dakota is very young. Uh, we're in our infancy. I like to uh, tell people that we're kind of like California from the 60s or Willamette Valley from the 70s. Uh, we're in our infancy, but as a result of that, we also work very collaboratively with all the wineries. Uh, there's a wine trek for uh, eight wineries in the uh, Red River Valley. Uh, we share resources. We share, uh, we co-buy uh, uh, fruits and uh, bottles. Uh, we share equipment. We share ideas. We, uh, we quite frankly, critique each other's wines. And uh, helping one winery helps all the wineries. So uh, it's hard to have a wine trail when you're only going to one wine, winery. Um, so uh, Harleen had mentioned the uh, Grape and Wine Association that was formed uh, in 2006. Um, this past June, we formed the Winery Association of North Dakota. And it's pretty exciting for us commercial wineries to have the newest commercial wine association in the nation. Um, and um, it's there to advocate for the wineries, uh, for the agritourism, which just continues to grow in North Dakota. Uh, so what I'd like you to think about is, uh, if you haven't tasted North Dakota wine lately, uh, you probably haven't tasted North Dakota wine. We don't have uh, Grandpa's syrupy sweet diesel fuel choke cherry wine. Uh, you know, you can still get that with a balloon, if, you know, if you want to make it at home. Uh, but we have a huge variety of wines. and. Uh, each winery has a new, unique experience. Uh, there's, uh, there's old farmsteads, there's old granaries that have been converted to wineries. Uh, my place is brand new because I didn't have an old farmstead or an old winery. Uh, they're, they're scattered throughout North Dakota and every one of them is a unique experience. And that's what makes it fun to go to North Dakota wineries and experience not only the flavors, but also take a look at what, what each location is like. Um, so uh, with that, you know, I'd invite you to go out on the trek, uh, go to the events. Unfortunately, uh, the Wasail event at uh, Cottonwood Cider House, the Maker's Market at 4E and the Grape Stop at Florida Vines are all postponed until next year. But uh, go out and look at their websites, look at their Facebook locations, look at our Facebook locations. 
there's always something going on and we invite you to come out and enjoy North Dakota wine. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Mark, Harleen and Greg for um, that wonderful information. I, when we first talked about this conversation today and talking about grapes, um, from vine to glass, um, it it was it's something that we've been thinking about. But to hear you all talk about this um, research and production and how it's translating into these amazing wines that you're creating is so fun and and interesting to learn about. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. I will ask all of our presenters to turn your video on now for our Q and A. Um, portion of the presentation. Um, so now is your time where you get to ask questions of these awesome folks. So go ahead and type that into um, the Q&A box below and we'll um, run through those questions. Um, but I kind of have one to get us started. So um, Harleen, you talked about this process of um, developing these more cold, hardy, resistant grapes. And Greg and Mark, you talked about how you guys are really thinking about these fruits and the flavors of the prairie. And I'm kind of curious, Harleen, when you are breeding these, these cold hardy grapes, do, is that a very different flavor that you're getting um, than you are from other traditional grapes that are used in winemaking? And then Greg and Mark, how are you kind of um, playing with and, and using those flavors to make really delicious wine? So Harleen, would you wanna um, start first? Okay, um, so the, the native grape, the Vitus riparia, has a, a rather unique flavor. Um, very high in acids and can be um, kind of really herbaceous. Uh, it's, it's, that's a hard tech, um, term to kind of, um, well, kind of think of uh, green beans. If you're eating, or green pepper, I guess, would be a better one. You're eating a grape and you're going, boy, this kind of tastes kind of like a green pepper. Um, so with the breeding process, those are things you don't really want. <laughs> um, so um, any kind of a breeding process, you're trying to find that needle in the haystack. So that one out of, you know, we've had we've had over fifteen thousand uh, plants that individuals that we've been tested. So we're trying to find you know those that you know they have a unique flavor, but and I wouldn't say that it mimics any of the uh, Vitus vinifera, uh, but we're trying to get as close as possible to Vitus vinifera and as far away as possible from Vitus riparia as possible. Yeah, drinking a green pepper or green bean does not sound very appealing to me. So um, that, that's really interesting. Um, Greg and Mark, can you kind of comment on your use of those grapes and adapting with those flavors? Yeah, I think, well, you know, I think a couple of things, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different flavor profiles. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, Marquette um, is a light red, um, Frontenac, these are all University of Minnesota grapes. Uh, Frontenac has kind of a, a, a dark cherry, Frontenac Gris uh, is more stone fruit, apricot. Frontenac Blanc is, is pineapple-y, um, and there's a, uh, a release of, of uh, Petite Pearl from a private breeder uh, that is really complex and has got some tannin structure, uh, but uh, quite frankly, it, Part of it is in the winemaking, there's ways to help mitigate some of that herbaceousness, but it's not entirely successful all the time. Uh, we deal with acid uh, through blending through, or through amelioration, adding water. Um, we try not to use chalk if we don't have to, um, but um, you know, we, we kind of embrace those different flavors and uh, through blending and through different yeasts and uh, through a, a, a process called malolactic fermentation, converting the malic acid to lactic acid. There are some things winemakers can do, but the best wine is not made in the winery. The best wine is made in the vineyard. I think Greg would agree with that. Yeah, one of the things I actually love about uh, wine being local and regional is that um, 
each region has unique flavors. And I think the grapes that grow here will have distinctive, unique flavors of our region. And it's not going to be a California wine. People come into the winery and ask, do you have a Chardonnay or, or something like that? And I'm like, no, we don't grow that here. We have better flavors. I won't say better flavors, different flavors. And I think one of the things that, um, I love, love, love our white grapes that we have in this region. They have such a huge range of different flavors from something that, okay, if I'm going to compare it to something like a Pinot Grigio from Italy to something that's really floral to something that's really fruity and apricots and lychees. And, and so the range of flavors in our white wines are, I think, greater than what you would find from a typical vinifera in California. And I have many people come to the winery and say, I don't usually like white wines, but these are really delicious. And I think that those kinds of fruits really shine. Um, that's awesome. You know, I think one other thing, one other thing that does, uh, from cold hardy grapes, their tannin structure, they have a lot less tannin than most um, uh, uh, the vitis, uh, vinifera grapes, and because they have less tannin, they're actually uh, less astringent. They're they're more approachable. People who tell me they don't like red wine, dry red wine, are usually quite surprised at uh, that they like a dry northern climate red wine, and it's partially because they're they aren't fighting the tannins. Very interesting. Um, do you, just quick question, do you, does it offend you all at a winemaker when people come up and say, I like Chardonnay, can you help me find something that tastes like that? I know I'm guilty of that, so just, just personal question here. No, I, I understand the question because that's what people know, and so I really like to have that question because then I can actually uh, educate them about what we do have and what the local flavors are, and that gives me an opportunity then to introduce something new to them. You know, I think a couple of a couple of instances. Uh, we had a couple come into the winery uh, this spring, and their first question was, "Do you have Moscato?" Um, and the answer is, "No, we don't have Moscato. We can't grow Moscato grapes." Um, so that tells me they really, really like sweet wine. And uh, so we start with our Prairie Glacier, which is our sweetest white wine. Uh, but we had just released our Hop Rocker, which is our uh, hopped apple wine, which is absolutely bone dry. There's no residual sugar in it at all. But because of the flavor of the apple, it tastes sweet. Well, that couple that walked in wanting Moscato tasted the driest wine we have. And they each had a glass of that wine. And of all the 19 wines we have, including sweet wines, they bought two bottles of our driest wine. So part of it is having people experiment and get educated on on the different types of wine. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's so wonderful that we have that opportunity now in our community with these great local wineries that we can go and do those tastings and discover flavors that we didn't even know we liked or we had a preconception of what we thought we liked, but um, that, that's wonderful. Um, this is a question for Harleen. Um, Harleen, would there be a vine that you'd suggest that we should start out growing? We have many acres along the Elk Creek of Untouched Prairie that we think will grow vines well. We are in Richland County, just west of Wapaton. So do you have some vines you'd recommend to someone who's just getting started? Okay. First, I, I, I approach that whole question with, what is your hope to do with this, these grapes? I mean, are, are you going to want to make, um, sell them to a winery? Are you, why are you growing these grapes? Are you going to go and have a winery yourself? Are you just a hobbyist that you want to go and make a little bit of wine? You want to primarily have juice? So first you need to find out what, what the intention is. Now if the, the intention is, oh, I want to grow grapes for a winery, then I tell the, the person, you, you first need to go and find out what grapes the winery wants. And being in, in that area, you, know, uh, you probably do a number of, uh, be able to get a number of cold hardy grapes to go, cultivars to do quite well. 
Perfect. And um, he, he or she, I'm not sure, um, commented that they're planning to sell to 4E so they can communicate with Greg, I guess, and, um, and work on that together. So yep. that's wonderful. Yep. Um, this is a question that um, <clears throat> I'll start with Harleen, but it can go to all of you um, from Noel. Is climate change affecting grape production in North Dakota? Okay. You know, climate change, I think, if you look at the temperatures of what's um, our average cold temperature, yes, over the years, we're getting a little bit warmer in the winter. And um, during the summer, it's probably gradually going up as well. Um, but the problem is, just like I, I mentioned, in the February, late January of 2008, nope, 19, it was minus 38 for Fahrenheit for three, three nights. We had an overnight low of minus 38. So it's those kind of unique plunges that occur. On average, it'd be, yeah, this would be wonderful. But it's those unique events that really catch um, the grapes and, and cause us those problems. We've had severe dieback in um, 2008, 2009. Um, again, well, I'd say it was, we had some injury in, in 2012, 2013, and then now this 2018, 2019. So if we, you know, even though everything on average is getting warmer, it's those times where you go and have these big abrupt changes, maybe in November, maybe in January. And I could have thrown up a slide that goes in and pictures how these minimums and how all of a sudden you'll have a 70 degree change. And, and that's the problem that um, I think in, with the climate change generalizing gets us in trouble. All right, interesting, thank you. Greg, um, do you have a comment on climate change in your production? Uh, I haven't really noticed a lot except these fluctuations that become more dramatic in the spring, I think that Harleen was alluding to. Um, I, we've seen a little bit more of frost damage and things in the spring because if the grapes wake up too early and then they're prone to freezing because they warm up early but then it freezes again, this is one of the big problems. And Mark? Yeah, I, I, it's probably a combination of not only climate change, but uh, a couple of big issues that we have is, uh, you know, we can get the grapes to survive. Uh, the question is, can we get the grapes to uh, bud out late enough so they don't freeze uh, and ripen fast enough uh, that we can harvest them and let the vines go back into dormancy before we hit a, uh, you know, the dead of winter. So. Uh, we have seen climate change, uh, you know, we had the polar vortex uh, decimated a lot of vineyards throughout North America a couple of years ago, um, but I think it's really kind of a combination of, of climate change uh, or the climate that we have and finding a grape through research that will uh, come out of dormancy late, ripen really fast, and uh, go back into dormancy in our short period of time. And, that's the challenge that breeders have. I'm not sure how much climate change is affecting the, the moisture patterns, um, but it has been a little more wet the last couple of years and that's been having an effect as well. Um, especially in my region where I don't have the nice sandy soils like Mark does, I have clay underneath my topsoil. Yeah, and, and just so interesting how the um, soil can change because you guys aren't that far apart from each other, so. Um, the next question is from Kelly, um, and it's for Greg and Mark. Besides the wineries themselves, where else can folks buy your wonderful wines? Ah, Greg, you want to take it first? Thank you. I think many of us are self-distributing in the local area. So the first place to check is your local stores, mm -hmm. like in Fargo. I know we have several wines in Happy Harry's, and the Spirit Shop has most of our wines, Bernie's on South University. Um, we have some in... Uh, uh, Bismarck at uh, Willikers, and we have some in Jamestown. 
Um, so it depends. We don't widely distribute because we do it our self-distribution. Um, some wineries do use distributors to get them a little bit further, but check your local stores. And if you go to a restaurant, by the way, most restaurants, it's hard to get local wines into restaurants because they want that, that $5 cheap California wine to put on their menu. <laughs> Um, but if people start asking for local wines in restaurants, they're more apt to, to uh, patronize us and get those wines there. And Mark? Yeah, I think I, we, you know, we, we're in a couple of uh, um, retail liquor stores in Fargo. Uh, we're in the process of expanding out to Valley City and Jamestown, and that's probably as far as, as we'll distribute because we do self-distribute, so we have to drive the wine out. Um, our uh, our Frontenac Gris Rosé wine uh, can be found at Blackbird Woodfire Pizza in downtown Fargo now. And uh, probably within the next week or two, uh, I believe that we'll be at uh, Beer and Fish in downtown Fargo. Um, and we're working on a couple other restaurants. So uh, there are some restaurants that are starting to take notice of local wine. Um, that's awesome. And I, I know that I've been to the Hodo a couple times and seen your wine, wines there, Greg, but wonderful to hear that there are more restaurants that are interested in, in using local wines too. Um, Mark, you mentioned that you like to say that our wine industry in North Dakota is in its infancy. And so curious from each of your perspectives, what do we, um, what steps do you think need to be taken in our region from a, a research perspective, from a production, from the wineries, state support, um, whatever it might be. What, what are some, uh, just a couple steps that each of you think to, to move North Dakota wines to the next level? Um, Mark, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I think, you know, we've, we've taken a few steps. The, uh, the wine trek, the Red River Valley wine trek is in its second year. Uh, it's been highly successful. Uh, um, and uh, we've gotten a lot of support from the uh, Fargo-Moorhead Convention and Visitors Bureau. They've been fantastic in helping us. Last year they did some bus tours. Um, and with the new Winery Association of North Dakota uh, that was just formed in June, there's 14 wineries that now are working collaboratively, uh, not only in uh, policy, but also in, in marketing. So uh, it, it's, it's taken a while for us to no longer become the biggest secret in the state. Um, but uh, by working together with all the wineries, uh, we do help support each other and get the word out. And uh, we do get some support from the North Dakota Ag Department. Uh, we've gotten support from the North Dakota Department of Tourism uh, when they had funds in their budget. So uh, we are getting some state uh, and some local support uh, that just helping to grow the industry. Awesome. Harleen, would you like to take that next? Well, you know, I, I, I just think, you know, having as much support as possible I, it is always good. Uh, we try to go and, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're just there trying to help the growers and trying to help the wineries do um, succeed. And um, so with that, a lot of times to do any kind of research, you need funding. So, you know, that, that's always been probably a key obstacle. Some, um, well, almost all the other universities that have breeding programs have this locked in um, funding source such as the University of Minnesota. We don't have a locked in funding source. And, and so we have to go and, and really work hard for every nickel dime that we can get um, to go and do this. But, uh, you know, I'm still determined. I still have that German, I, hey, I'm gonna get this done, so. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and, and Greg, do you have some thoughts on advancing the industry? Yeah, I would say, I think um, what we're seeing now is that the growth of wineries has happened and that creates a demand for the fruit. And I think the work that Harleen's doing is so important for um, making sure that we can get vineyards in North Dakota. But there's another side of that and that is um, for North Dakota to really thrive with its fruits here, we really need people to, who want to establish some of those larger commercial vineyards and supply the wineries because the demand is there, the supply isn't. 
Um, that requires um, help from the state. This is a big ag state. Um, corn, soybeans, wheat, and sugar beets, and everything like that um, kind of rules everything. And so a small little winery with a little vineyard uh, doesn't really get, I think, the recognition it deserves and the help it deserves. Um, and so I think it, once, once we get a little bit more viable commercial sized vineyards in the state, hopefully then the state will take a little more notice. But I think they really need to be proactive in helping that to grow because without that, um, the wineries are going to have to be relying on neighboring states for local fruits. Um, that and uh, I think one of the big problems, not just here, but in California and everywhere else, is the issue of um, herbicide drift. Uh, I think there are some steps we can take in, in North Dakota to make that uh, better for high value fruit production like grapes. Perfect. Um, thank you guys all so much. Um, we are getting close to nine o'clock. And so we want to um, end today's conversation with a final question for each of you. Um, and, and I also want to make it a two part question. So the first part is tell us what your favorite personal wine is. And then the second is what can the viewers on um, our webinar today um, do to support your work? Um, how can we move that forward? So I'm just going to go in order on my screen. Greg, do you want to kick us off? Sure. People ask me which of my wines is my favorite, and I, my response is they're all my children, and they're special and unique in their own way. <laughs> um, but wine is a very wine wine is a very personal thing, so it, it depends on what people like. But I like a dry red, so I really love our Marquette, um, and then the Estate Frontenac that we grow here. Um, what can people do to help support? Uh, go out and visit the wineries. Take a tour, learn what they're doing, learn the stories and talk to the owners and, and uh, encourage your friends to do the same. And that's what's going to help. Excellent. Mark? Mark, you, you're, you're muted, Mark. Okay, so I got a cup, um, probably not a favorite, but two favorites. One would be my uh, red grape favorite, which would be Petite Pearl. Uh, it's a brand new grape that was just released by the breeder in 2009. We're, we as winemakers have an opportunity to, to experiment with this grape as a brand new grape. It's a full body, uh, complex grape, uh, red. We do it as a dry red um, on oak, and it, it's my favorite red. Uh, my other favorite would be uh, Glacier Gold, which is yellow choke cherry wine. We were the first winery in the world to ever produce yellow choke cherry wine. Uh, we're one of two wineries that we know of in North America right now that still produce it. Uh, we grow it here where we have uh, one of two yellow choke cherry commercial orchards in North America. So uh, we're, we're proud to be uh, on the leading edge of that. Uh, uh, but we have 19 wines, so it's really kind of hard to find out one that we drink exclusively. Um, what can we do? Um, support the wineries. Uh, and, you know, supporting one winery supports all the wineries. Uh, we know that, that people will go to different wineries for different reasons. Um, and we don't expect everybody to come to our wine exclusively. We don't want that. Um, support all the wineries. That includes meaderies. Uh, that also includes cideries. Uh, those are all uh, wineries, and uh, when you support one, you're supporting all of them. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I was I, I was wondering if you would make reference that it's impossible to pick a favorite wine, that it's like picking a favorite child. So um, yeah, it really does come down to personal preference. Um, and then Harleen, favorite wine, and then what can we do to support your work? Um. Yeah, Greg hit it on the nose. Uh, you know, when my kids go and say, hey, which one, when they were growing up, which one was the, f the favorite? And I said, I treated you all the same. And I actually said I, I hated them all just to make them feel bad. But um, no, I, 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 I am, I have a preference for reds and dry reds, similar to Greg. But be, beyond that, you could put anything in front of me and, and I'd be happy as the lark. Um, and as far as um, support, support local. That's all I can say is more support for local, um, the better off everyone is. 
All right. Um, wonderful. Thank you all so much for this fabulous information. I know that I am super excited to go buy and drink some more local wines after this. So I hope that others are too. Um, so yeah, I, I wish that we could give you all a round of applause in person, but know that I'm sure everyone is at home doing the same thing. So thank you, Greg, Mark, and Harleen. Um, so just a couple of quick notes as we wrap up today. Um, we have recorded today's presentation, so it will be available on the Food of the North website as well as on Facebook, so watch for that. And our next First Fridays will be September 4th, and we are looking forward to a conversation on regenerative grazing. So we're going to have Marshall Johnson from the Audubon Dakota, Kevin Sedovic from NDSU, and Daniel Paul from Wild Prairie Beef. And they're going to be talking about herd management and how um, we are raising beef in this region um, to not only be making quality beef, but also be good for the land and good for the birds that live on that land. So it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend and hope to see you back in September. Take care.